uh, are outpacing puts one and a half to one, but I wouldn't really read too much into that. And then options are implying about a two and a half percent move in either direction between now and Friday. So short term until March expiry. And then the trade that I really think kind of continues the narrative is about 10,000 of the 225 and a half strike puts in March traded for about 130. So you're spending about half of a percent for some downside protection between now and Friday. Again, just kind of putting out some insurance on the books, given the negative news flows that we've been seeing as of late. All right. Well, for more options action, be sure to tune into the full show. That's Friday, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. Up next, find out if America agrees with Guy's bull case on AMD. Head to Twitter um, and vote in our poll at, Fast, at CNBC Fast Money. Excuse me. Results are right after this quick break. Options Action is sponsored by Think or Swim by TD Ameritrade. Or much more if you're trading big bucks. Tonight, children detained at the border, what they're facing inside holding facilities, plus a spring break nightmare for law enforcement. The facts, the truth, the news with Shepard Smith, 7 Eastern, CNBC. Welcome back to Fast Money. Time to find out if viewers at home are buying Guy's pitch on AMD. And this one electrified the Twitterverse. More than 75% of voters are buying your pitch, Guy. Congratulations. I think that's a record. And Twitter wasn't just loving your pitch. They love you. Look at this. <laughs> and in case you're unclear, this is a deep fake. This is not Guy actually singing. So, Guy, enjoy the win. Final trade time. Tim. Thank you, Mel. My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer.
Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Cray America. Other people want to make friends? I'm just trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate, to teach. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Now, look, if you only learn one thing from the pandemic, I want you to remember this. I want you to remember that betting against the end of the world is a sucker's game. The next time you think the world is ending, you have to assume that it isn't. I want you to take the other side of the trade. I want you to bet against the end of the world. Now, on the anniversary of the worst part of the COVID-19 crash, we got to think about something. We have to think about how this market managed to surge to new highs. Even if it only dipped this afternoon, Dow slipping 128 points, S&P declining 0.16%, NASDAQ edging up 0.09%, tech-heavy NASDAQ, excuse me. We know it is easy to succumb to panic, <laughs> which is what happened on March 16th last year when the Dow dropped nearly 3,000 points and the S&P gave up 12%, not in a year, not in a month, but in a day. The house of pain. Closing the day down 30% from the 2020 highs. Do you know that only nine names in the S&P finished in the green that hard day? Nine out of 500, 500 in the S&P. Now, don't I know it? I was as freaked out as anyone else. I spent the previous month screaming at the top of my lungs about the dangers of the pandemic. A lot of people felt I had been chicken little. I was saying how it could destroy whole industries, and the government was doing nothing. They know nothing! I want you to look at this clip from the end of the show one year ago. I tried to be constructive this evening, but I want to be sure you understand my view, okay? Not only me not out of the woods, but, man, if you're in travel, if you're in leisure, uh, entertainment, restaurants, okay, hotels, aerospace, bad. All right, bad. I don't, I don't have anything good to say. I, I have anything good to say since the Super Bowl, and I redouble my not having anything good to say. Redouble not anything good to say. Now, the question is, was that a misread of the situation? Absolutely not. If anything, it was the opposite. See, I was pleading with policymakers to do something, to think big, because this was a major horrendous crisis, and we didn't have time for the usual partisan bickering. I wanted action. The time had come to part the waters, and the waters had to be parted by the president, the treasury secretary, the speaker of the house, the Senate majority leader, and most important, the Federal Reserve. What's amazing is that the seeds for the turnaround were actually planted in that same 24-hour news cycle. The previous night, Fed Chief Jay Powell took to the airwaves and called for a full 1% rate cut. A huge round of bond buying. Buy, 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 buy! A, a slash in the discount window so desperate uh, banks could get capital, all of them. And a coordinated action by central banks all over the world to fight the collapse in economic activity. These were all huge positives, so we got to ask ourselves, wait a second. Why did the market flip out and crash the next day? Because Wall Street listened to a special Sunday edition of J-PAL and jumped to the conclusion that things must be much worse than they looked. Otherwise, why make such drastic moves? In retrospect, the market was remarkably dumb. See, it, it also, and this was another one. Do you know that we got two big pauses that day that were completely overlooked? They were, they were asterisks, even as they held the metaphorical keys to finding the bottom. First, analysts learned that Tesla would have plenty of capital on hand, and the company would be able to make the numbers despite the production shutdowns. That news shocked the skeptics and caught the attention of what's most important, a new generation of less jaundiced in investors, individual investors, who are about to get stimulus checks and put their money where their mouth is. Similarly, a little biotech outfit. It's called Moderna. It announced that their vaccine candidate had blocked the virus. Big trial? One patient. Stock soared 24%. Over the next few days, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin worked with Congress to put together a massive stimulus package, much larger than anyone could have dreamed. The market went up and down and up and down, depending on every single news headline. But it shouldn't have, because it was clear we were going to get a package still. Even after that, the market remained skeptical. You know, we didn't actually bottom until a week later when Congress passed the gargantuan $2 trillion aid package and Chairman Powell went on the Today Show warning people not to bet against the Fed. His key line, we're not going to run out of ammunition. That doesn't happen. And you know what? That was it. Today Show. Ever since this market's run up practically in a straight line, 
as it became clear that Powell wasn't kidding. He even went so far as implicitly backstopping corporate bonds so that troubled companies could keep borrowing money and wouldn't go under. Now, Wall Street stayed skeptical, though, as many high-profile hedge fund managers roiled the market with their own negativity. But when individuals got those stimulus checks from the government, the craziest thing happened. Lots of those people opened accounts at Robinhood or other commission-free brokers, and they went to work doing one thing, pretty much, and one thing only. They were buying what the hedge funds were selling. Now, I've done a lot of work on that period, including talking to the trading desks and the people behind the scenes at the largest companies that were involved in brokerage. And these legions of new buyers, they went for what a lot of people felt were the most dangerous stocks imaginable. They just sat there every morning. Some of them started at 4.35 a.m. and they bought the cruise lines. They bought the airlines. They bought the stuff that I talked about was super dangerous. And of course, they bought Tesla. Their buying was relentless. At the time, it did seem foolish, especially since the so-called smart money was still betting on the end of the world. The rest, though, is history. The government more or less did its job, putting a floor on the economy. But more important, the scientists really delivered. That Moderna vaccine that stopped one, one person's COVID a year ago, one person from being infected, turns out it, wor it worked for millions, along with the similar two-shot combo from Pfizer. Moderna's now working on a pediatric trial to protect the last group that's still at risk that the FDA hasn't allowed any protection for its children. Remember, this was never a financial crisis. It was always a public health crisis. You keep the economy on life support until the pandemic is solved, you get to the promised land. That's what the that's what a week ago last what the week was last year. That's what it was about. Of course, there is a ton of cosmic irony. I mean, you know what? Look at this. This is a, a today's Wall Street Journal front page, and it, it does make me nervous. I've got to tell you that. Uh, it makes me blanch more like it. It's the exact opposite of what they printed a year ago. Lead story: Air travel showing signs of turning a corner. Special travel's finally coming back. Here's another one. Banks eye cash reserves for profits. This is the single most positive piece the Wall Street Journal has ever published about the financials in ages. Look out. Or how about this one? Housing boom is different. It's a story that explains how the current boom is fueled by home buyers putting down big wads of cash. Not at all like the 2000s when it was all financed by debt. Then, if you want some levity, we got it. Tesla crowns its new techno king about uh, Elon Musk giving himself an absurd new title. He actually felt compelled to file with the SEC to make it official. Um, we can laugh now, but if he'd done that a year ago, his shareholder base would have had a panic attack. So when it looks like the world's ending, you have to bet that it won't end. But there is a flip side to the argument. Sometimes you get moments that are too good to be true. If Jay Powell saw a depression coming and decided to head it off, maybe one day he'll see an overheated economy coming in and he'll head that off by slamming on the brakes. Now, I doubt that's happening anytime soon. Uh, but he's been adamant that he won't tighten it until he really sees uh, he's, he's not going to tighten the first sign of inflation. The, the Fed has done that a lot of times and it's failed. Plus, Powell's been much more dovish since his rate hikes almost destroyed the economy at the end of 2018. Boy, did he ever learn his lesson? Here's the bottom line. Well, you know what? Your lesson is clear. When our policymakers actually learn from the past and our scientists work their magic, then the darkest moment really is just before the dawn. And the light at the end of the tunnel is genuine sun. Not that of an oncoming train. I need to go to Raymond in California. Raymond. Hey, Jim Boy, Booyah. This is Ramon from Pacoima in California. Tell the truth. What do you got going? I first like to thank you for uh, doing everything that you do to help us investors in this big pond we call investing. Well, thank you. My, my, question, my question is on Funko, ticker symbol FNKO, Jim. Seeing that the stock in the beginning of last year reached its 52 week low of 312, ever since then it's been on a tear uh, with its latest earnings beating. Uh, and it gave, gave a 52 week high of almost 20. Right. Jim, do you think this stock could double? Look, triple? the numbers, I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, a JP Morgan boost turned this thing on. But more importantly, let me tell you something. It does have a $20 price. Sorry. Let me tell you what I think happened here. There were a lot of shorts, and we got a lot of shorts. Well, guess what goes on? Funko, GME, you get the picture. Holly in New York. Holly. Hi, Jim. Thank you for taking my call. Of course, Holly. Um, How you been? I bought, oh, very good, thank you, but I need a little help. All right. Um, I bought wor uh, Workhorse um, on the way up, um, and on the largest uh, pullback year-to-date, um, uh, the market had. Yeah. Uh, the news came out that uh, United Postal Service gave uh, the contract to another company other than Workhorse. I know. In addition, 
Yeah, it's terrible. And in addition, um, there's now a class uh, action lawsuit being filed against Workhorse. My question to you is, do I buy into the week? No, weekend? Holly, that was a big, that they didn't get that contract was very big, and I don't think that's going to be reversed. The most important thing that Workhorse, which I now regard as a show horse, has got, it has a 25% short position. So in any good news, it can rally. I just don't know what the good news will be. And that's why I invite Dwayne Hughes to come on the show and tell us why they didn't win the contract and how maybe they can get it back. Okay, it's been a tough year, but betting on the end of the world is a mugs game. On May Money tonight, as the vaccine roll continues and more economies start to reopen, could a company like Dow be well positioned in this market? Yeah, the giant chemical company. I'm going to talk with the CEO. Then, despite what David Faber might tell you yesterday, I was lucky enough to become the first journalist anywhere to ride in a lucent air. I'm going to tell you all about the experience and whether it bodes well for the stock when I sit down with the CEO. And wear your seatbelt in the back next time. And high-end retailers have been riding higher since the late 2020. Could they stay in fashion in this market? I'm going off the charts to find out. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. March 18th. Join CNBC's Inclusion and in Action Forum for...
A year ago, today, as I said at the top of the show, we experienced the worst decline in the history of the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P as the last holdouts finally freaked out about COVID. That night, we spoke to Jim Fitterly, who's the CEO of Dow Inc. That's the giant chemical company. Even though his stock was down 60% year-to-date, double the S&P, he told a very optimistic story about the resilience of Dow's business and its ability to generate cash, even in a tough environment. Enough cash to pay the dividend, which was an incredible 12%. He put his money where his mouth is and just bought nearly $2 million from Dow stock personally. I sure hope you're watching because that was the exact bottom for the stock. Since then, it's nearly triple, and I think the future is still bright. So let's check in with Jim Fiddling, the chairman and CEO of Dow, Inc., to get a better read on where where his company's headed after their very bullish presentation at the J.P. Morgan Industrial uh, Conference just this morning. Mr. Finnerling, welcome back to Mad Money. Jim, good to be here, and congratulations on 16 years of Mad Money. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Well, I want to congratulate you on coming. Out. One of the reasons why we have a show and it's been gone is because we have people like you come on. When everyone else is uh, just saying it's it's the darkest day ever, Dow going to cut the dividend, you came on our show and you said, look, I'll just tell you, I'm buying nearly $2 million worth of the stock. How did you know when all these great Wall Street guys seem to be confused? Well, I've got a team that knows how to execute. And so we've got a, a pretty good eye on what the, is happening in the global economy. And we felt good about where things were going. We didn't feel good about where we were at the time, but we also felt that we were significantly undervalued and things were not as bad as, as they were going to be portrayed in the market. And we'd seen China start to come back from the pandemic at that point and get it under control. And now we're starting to see that rebound in the United States. Third quarter and fourth quarter were strong and we finished the year strong more than $14.6 billion of cash and committed liquidity, paid down $2.6 billion of debt, kept our costs under control, supported that dividend. And we're, in, we're back to pre-COVID levels now, even without the industrial economy really coming back yet or without the service sector coming back yet. Well, I am glad you mentioned the last, because I get a little confused at J.P. Morgan Conference. Look at this. Here's a guy, uh, he says on March 8th, trough to peak. Oh, well, thank you, because we know we're supposed to sell at peak. Then today, the cat is out of the bag. Oh, I see. Everybody knows it's good, so therefore it's bad. I, I look at it, and I think, you're huge in housing. You're huge in auto. We did have a storm that actually benefited you, but the parts of the U.S. economy that are just beginning to be on fire or have been on fire are Dow parts of the, of the economy. They are. They're, uh, look, 25% of what we sell goes into housing and housing-related purchases. That's up double digits. Uh, e even home resales are up double digits here in the United States. I think that looks strong. Uh, we don't yet have the industrial economy back yet. But look at autos year over year are strong. The trend towards EVs is very positive. Alternative energy, which we sell a lot into, is very strong. Packaging has held up tremendously. Look at the amount of e-commerce business in China. China has hit 50% retail sales through e-commerce. Do you know the amount of packaging and adhesives that we use to go into that e-commerce shipments is a big driver of growth for us. So I feel good. I think as we get people vaccinated, as we get people traveling again, as the service sector comes back, there's another leg up on this. And I still feel like the industrial economy, which really cramped down on CapEx last year, still is coming back, but it's gradual. They haven't really come back in a big way. We're seeing some big announcements on EVs. We're seeing some big announcements on alternative energy, on semiconductor chips. But we're going to have more big announcements that are come through this year and that's going to portend well for the back half of the year and into 2022. Yeah, people should know you are. Uh, this is a Dow chemical that when you think of EV, you should think of this company. When you think of semiconductors, you should be thinking about this company. And packaging, you should be starting to think about Affinity RE. Packaging business recently launched its sustainable hot melt adhesive uh, poly uh, polyethylene uh, <laughs> elastomer. I mean, I don't. it's complicated, but it's your stuff, right? Well, there right? you go. Well, when you go out into the garage and take apart all those Amazon boxes or the other packaging you get uh, e-commerce shipments in, and you see that adhesive that, that holds those together, that's a hot melt adhesive, and that's a, a high growth space for us. So more of that packaging drives that. But the nice thing about Affinity RE is that is made with more of a bio-based material. It's 40% lower carbon footprint than the alternative. 
And that's a big driver of growth for us. Um, alternative uh, sustainability is a big driver of growth for Dow, and I think it's a huge opportunity for us to accelerate growth in the future. Uh, one last question. You have been consistent all along that you were going to deal with what a lot of people felt was the black hole of Sidara, this huge plant that we're always hoping to make so much money, uh, but you've had to deal with time and time again, but you ne you always persisted. Are we where it can be, uh, it can be cash flow neutral or even cash flow positive given the strength in your things? We've been successful to get Sadara refinanced. Uh, Sadara was positive uh, equity earnings in the fourth quarter, and it looks like it's going to be that way in the first quarter. It's been running well. And of course, it's benefited from the growth in Asia and the fast recovery from COVID. So we're, we're in a position where we feel it's cash flow self sustainable. That's a $350 million a year tailwind for us from a cash perspective. And I think we've uh, turned the corner. Well, and Jim, you know, I got to be thinking about uh, last year when you're on 12% dividend. People are talking about you having that. I got to start thinking about you boosting the dividend, buying back stock. Your stock's too cheap, still has a good yield. Are these things in the cards? Are they, uh, or am I just too hopeful? Well, first things first, I need to get CapEx back up. I've got right. some organic growth investments to capture some of that growth. And so we've moved CapEx up 350 million this year. And I want to make sure that we sustainably grow into that dividend and support it long term. That's a very good dividend, but I also need to grow the top line and the bottom line for our shareholders. Well, uh, you have done great for your shareholders, and I hope you brought a lot of new ones in. Very few people came in at the absolute depths and said, you know what? This is a great time to buy my stock, and you were probably the most prominent. Thank you one year later for coming on with those great numbers. Jim Fitterling, Chairman and CEO of Dow Chemical. Go always good to see you. Stay safe, Jim. It's still not expensive, people. You see all these flying cyclicals? How about one that's inexpensive with a dividend, not others that we hope will come back? Man, money's back after the break. Coming up, could Kramer give you the green light to invest in a SPAC name? The CEO of Lucid Motors hops in the driver's seat for an exclusive interview just ahead. Next. All right, welcome guys, welcome to the stream. I'm gonna take this commercial break just to um, show you guys my new uh, Patreon. I just opened this chat room yesterday. I have it under beta. I only have 46 remaining spots for $3.99. This is a service I'm gonna be charging $9.99 in the future. You're gonna have all access, includes instant trade alerts, instant investment alerts, growth stock news alerts, smart money sentiment. So I have a lot of charts. This is what the Discord looks like. Um, I have here the welcome screen that tells you about um, how, to, how the Discord room is uh, designed and functions. I have the terms and conditions, uh, some links, how to learn how to trade options. Uh, recently joined, message board. I'll be posting up here any messages here. I have market insight here, any news and alerts of SPACs or any companies that are merging or uh, upcoming dates. So I put a lot of stuff here. I also have smart money sentiment and order flows here on the Discord while you be posting every day, uh, stuff like this, top gainers. Uh, I have uh, top gainers for today, uh, FTCV with the, uh, I believe this is the eToro. So these are the top gainers, top losers. So I put a lot of resources here. I also post ARK, uh, ARK Invest uh, trade desk information here. I put my trades here, what I buy. I also put my investments, what I'm investing on. So there's a lot of stuff here going on here. Uh, if you guys want to check it out, I'll type in the uh, look in the link in the description. Also, I'll type it in the chat room. Um, so I'm doing a, a special since I just opened this chat room is brand new. So I only have 50 beta members to start off the Patreon. So I appreciate it, guys. Take a look. Uh, take a look at the run the chat room. If you guys don't like it, you guys can cancel. I post, uh, I'll be posting daily. Today was my first day. So if you guys want to be part of the group, uh, be part of the first 50 and honor that price since the beginning, you guys will be able to. Melt away daily tension. The all new XHMT massage chair by X chair at xchair.com. The future feels good. For too many investors, 2020 looked like this. 
For VectorVest investors, 2020 looked more like this because they knew when to buy, when to sell, and when to get back in. VectorVest's specific market timing calls, powerful search and analysis tools, and pre-built dynamic trading systems helped our subscribers capture way more profit instead of letting it slip away, even in 2020. Want proof? Go to VectorVest.com forward slash prove it. VectorVest. Because you deserve a better year. Keeping your oyster business growing has you swamped. You need to hire. I need Indeed. Indeed you do. The moment you sponsor a job on Indeed, you get a short list of quality candidates from a resume database. Claim your $75 credit when you post your first job at Indeed.com slash promo. Look, I've been warning about the SPAC attack for months, especially in the electric vehicle space. But some of these SPAC names are actually worth buying in weakness. Take Churchill Capital 4. That's a special purpose acquisition vehicle that's merging with Lucid Motors. That's an up-and-coming Tesla rival that plans to start producing its gorgeous cars in the second half of the year. This one's got two things going for it. Lucid Motors is a legitimate company that will soon have an actual product to sell. I saw it for myself yesterday and was wowed. Plus, Churchill Capital stock has come down a lot. It, it, it surged to around 65 before we knew the terms of the deal. Then it got cut in half over the next couple of days when the reality couldn't keep up with Wall Street's irrational exuberance that was stoked by inaccurate news stories about the company's intentions. I think the stock's very intense I see if these levels do not take it from me. Let's dig deeper with Peter Rawlinson, the CEO and Chief Technical Officer of Lucid Motors, to find out where this story is headed. Mr. Rawlinson, welcome back to Mad Money. Great to be with you, Jim. All right, so Peter, I took a ride in your car yesterday in the Lucid Air, and I echo many people when I say, how can I get one? When can I get one? Because this is the most exciting technology delivery machine I have come across in years. Thank you so much. And we're nearly sold out to Dream Edition. We've just got a few uh, reservations left. Uh, and our run of 500 is very nearly sold out. And we've got a very large proportion of our pre-orders for the, the following uh, Grand Touring version. And our order book is filling very nicely. So, so roll up or you'll miss out on Dream Edition. Well, look, i got to tell you, I'm not sure exactly what speed I went and, oh, and how we slowed down and spun around. Maybe just tell us how quickly, because I think one of the things that's important is we either think you get long range performance uh, or you, you, know, you get uh, some sort of technology that does not offer that. You know, uh, we often have batteries that go long and the performance is awful. Which, you got them both, right? That's what I saw yesterday. Indeed, Jim. And we've got this unique fusion, this blend of performance and range. And we achieve that through our in house technology. All the technology that underpins the car, the drivetrain technology, a battery pack, a motor, transmission, inverter, and the wonder box and the software that glues all that together. That's all in-house, it's all proprietary, and we have incredible efficiency, and that gives performance and range. You're talking about a quick zero to 60, as well as a projected range that's much longer than a large, a large scale rival? Indeed, and versions of Lucid Air will achieve over 500 miles range on an estimated EPA cycle. Now, I, I know that you said you're almost sold out of everything. I mean, if I were to pay $170,000 for a Lucid Air, when would I be able to get mine in 2020? 2020 we're, start, we're starting production from our purpose-built uh, EV plant in Casa Grande in Arizona in the second half of 21, so very soon now. Now, I think it's important, just in terms of being in our great country, there are a lot of factories that get built, and maybe there's 200 people in them. Uh, there's almost new, no new greenfield factories that put people to work. Tell us about your plant in Arizona. I'm so excited about it because we've got a great team of associates working there. We're giving them high tech, great jobs in a great working environment, and we're bringing jobs and employment in high-tech auto industry to the state of Arizona. Um, we've already got several hundred people employed. We'll bring on uh, a second and a third shift as we progress through 2022. And we're already planning for our phase two of that plant, the expansion, which we'll implement in 2023, which will take us to a capacity of over 85,000 units per annum when we bring in the SUV 
Project Gravity, um, it, hopefully in Q3 of 23. I think it's important for people to understand that unlike a competitor that a lot of people worried about for years and years, the money that you have right now will get you to that expansion that you're talking about. Indeed, this is an amazing outcome from, a, from our merger process with Churchill Capital. Uh, we secured four and a half billion dollars through both the SPAC and the pipe with an unprecedented array of blue chip investors. And that really secures the future of Lucid. And, and, and I mean, this is very interesting because that competitor was only able to secure several hundred million at IPO, and it meant that it had to really look for fresh injections of capital many times. And with this capital, we secure our future well into 2023. We can implement phase two of the factory in Arizona. We can add, you know, more than two and a half thousand hourly and salaried manufacturing employees. We can bring all four trim levels of Lucid Air into production. And we can get Project Gravity well along the path to production with prototypes built and a lot of testing under our belt. And then there's the sales and service and R&D activities that we have got a very clear runway with the security of funding. We're in a very, very healthy position. You and I both know that the uh, internal combustion engine is, is a dinosaur. Uh, you also know that, you and I know that the demand for cars like Lucid are big. Let's say an Apple were to come in. Would, would Lucid have problems selling cars if the great Apple came in? Well, there's, there's always room for, for new entries. Uh, and, 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 and don't let's underestimate the market because this isn't a market for EVs. There's no such thing as an EV market. This is a market for cars and EVs will penetrate and uh, completely uh, fill that, that market, that world market for cars. So I'd welcome the competition from a company like Apple, but ultimately, you know, this is a technology race. Tesla recognizes that and Lucid recognizes that. And I think that's what differentiates. So many of the traditional car companies, they buy parts off the shelf, they take a commoditized right. approach to this. Lucid doesn't, it's all in-house, all in-house developed, designed, engineered, and manufactured. Vertically integrate your core IP. Only Tesla does that today. Right. Well, then I was privileged to be one of the first people to ever ride in one. And it was one of the most, I would say probably the most exciting things had me in many, many years. Peter Rawlinson, it's a joy to have you. CEO and CTO of Lucid Motors. Really good to have you on the show, sir. Delight to be here, Jim. Thank you so yeah. much. What can I say? All right. I called it maybe the next Tesla. A lot of people criticized me on uh, Twitter. You know what? I'll reiterate. It could be the next Tesla. May have money back there for the break. Coming up, has the death of retail been greatly exaggerated? A sector that's been hanging by a thread may yet be worth a stitch in time. Kramer knocks his socks off. Next. On Squawk Box, what BlackRock's Rick Reader sees ahead. From the Fed, market impact from interest rates, where stimulus money could be spent. First on CNBC tomorrow. Watch Squawk Box anytime on demand. With a bang, energy and change came to every part of our universe. Seismic or small, it continues. Change is all around us. Shaped by technology and human ingenuity. We can make it work for you and your business. It all starts with an invitation to experience Lexus. The Invitation to Lexus sales event. Get 0% APR financing on the 2021 RX 350. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. When pain wears you down, I see how dry spray delivers.
When the red-hot reopening stocks just got marked down, in some cases crushed, while the recent losers actually regained some footing. I think this is the perfect time to circle back to some of the high-end retailers that have been uh, put, let's just say they've had huge gains in the last five months, and maybe getting a chance to buy them. A year ago, as the whole world went into lockdown, it felt like we were dealing with retail Armageddon. And look, COVID wiped out a ton of brick-and-mortar outfits. 2020 was the biggest year of retail failures in history. Tons of iconic brands left for dead. The essential stores, well, they made out like bandits. Everybody else got crushed. But a funny thing happened on the way to the retail apocalypse. The second-tier non-essential franchises with deeper pockets did manage to survive the worst part of the pandemic. And once we started getting good news about potential vaccine candidates, their stocks exploded into the stratosphere. Macy's, Nordstrom, Tapestry, they're up more than 100% since we began to round the corner in early November. And by the way, a lot of these companies were given up for dead. So now we're in a new world. After Rocky Start, we got one of the, be one of the best vaccine rollouts on Earth. We're doing 2.4 million shots per day now. No more complaints. New infections and new deaths are both down big from their highs. Many states are starting to fully reopen. If anything, I wish they'd show actually a little more patience. And of course, I always want more shots and I also want more tests, but I don't want to gripe forever. Still, we can finally see the light at the end of the COVID tunnel. And that's happening uh, right as Washington's latest $2 trillion stimulus package kicks in. People are already getting their checks. We know from last time that much of that money will be spent. And not all on stocks. Put it all together, and you know what? You got a terrific situation for the high-end retailers. Unfortunately, that's not exactly news. Everybody saw this one coming, which is why their stocks have spent the last few months rocketing into the stratosphere. So I think we got to ask ourselves, have we missed the move? Or is it possible that the luxury retail names have more room to run? Only way to find this out is to go off the charts. So to, the, to do that, we're going to Bob Lang. He's the founder of ExplosiveOptions.net, as well as being the brilliant technician in the all-star duo behind the Street.com's Trifecta Stocks newsletter. And he's author of Know Your Options. So let's focus on four of them that a lot of you have asked me about. Three of them, then one is kind of a wild card. Capri, uh, which, by the way, that's how they pronounce it over there. Capri Holdings, Tapestry, Louis Vuitton and Nordstrom. Now, they've all had enormous gains, but when Lang looks at the action here, he sees more upside. So let's start with Capri Holdings. That's the house of brands formerly known as Michael Kors, although they also own Jimmy Choo and Versace, very big in China. Lang points out that the stock recently broke out on very high turnover. So you can see, look at this thing. Will you look at this? Uh, and, and that means you got a lot of institutional sponsorship when you see this kind of buying here. Uh, when you look at the relative strength index, RSI, that's an important momentum indicator. Well, Capri's in very overbought territory. Should we worry? Well, I don't know. Let's look at the check in money flow. That shows you whether big institutional money managers are still buying and selling or, or buying or selling. And look at this. It is sky high. That's the CMF we like so much. So Capri has the best momentum of any retail stock since the 2020 election. It's currently trading at 55 and change. Its old 2018 highs are in the 70s. Lag thinks this is the kind of stock that gets overbought. But instead of being fearful, he says it stays overbought, meaning he sees that it could revisit the old highs. That would be astonishing given the fact that so many people had given up on these guys who thought they spent too much money at Versace or, uh, frankly, just kind of felt that <sighs> brick and mortar. All right, how about the daily chart of Tapestry, which is the artist formerly known as Coach? Now, this is very similar to Capri. You got a massive run fueled by a series of higher highs and higher lows, and that's exactly what every chartist loves to see. Remember, I don't like when it goes parabolic. I like it when it does this kind of move. Right now, Tapestry is up 44% year to date to the point where it's only a few bucks, about, oh, about 10 bucks away from its 2018 highs. Meanwhile, the chicken money flow, oh, look at this thing. It's incredibly strong. Money is just piling in here. When the stock pulled back to its 50-day moving average back in January, that was your chance. These chances do happen, uh, opportunity, but then it knocked very quickly. Uh, Lion thinks Tapestry's a quiet leader with more room to run, part because the moving average convergence divergence, and that's called the MACD, recently made this bullish crossover that we love right here, black over red, okay? Uh, and this one is the most reliable pattern in the book. I don't want to see this thing go back down. <sighs> I don't. What can I tell you? I mean, he's pretty more, he's more bullish in tapestry than I am. But I've seen him on air. I mean, not on our show, unfortunately. That can change. All right, ne next up is one that you probably don't fo focus about unless uh, you uh, go to the store and see how much everything costs. And this is Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. Uh, the last two are more liquor than, uh, you know. But it, look, it, it means French. In and in French, it means luxury. 
It means expensive in French, like très cher. Yeah, let him eat gâteau. That's what she said to Marie Antoinette. It's gâteau. Anyway, I was almost surprised when they acquired Tiffany because the rest of the business makes Tiffany look cheap by comparison. Stocks are making new highs. I mean, look at this. Can you look at this? This is one of Europe's best performers. It's giving you a 50% gain since we started getting good on the vaccine front. So far in 2021, Lang points out that LVMUY spent the first couple of months just trading sideways, doing nothing, doing nothing, doing nothing. That's called building a base, which then creates a coiled spring situation. So now the stock's making a bold move higher. Meanwhile, let's go, let's go MACD. Let's go all over the MACD. Look at this. Bullish crossover right here, okay? Checking money flow? Oh, man, it's about as positive as it gets, right? Huge institutional buying. Lang's betting the big boys are not done. And what been one of European stock? Oh, I think we found one. I like Banco Santander, too, but this one is, wow. All right, now, finally, let's go over one that a lot of people felt really was a candidate to just well, let's just say go into oblivion, and that's Nordstrom. Last October, this high-end department store was fighting for its life. Look at this fight for its life right here. I mean, this thing was the total Toto. That's turn off the oxygen, Toto, not the dog. All right, it is tough to keep a department store afloat during a pandemic. I mean, you want to go there? However, the moment we got bullish clinical trial data from Pfizer and then Moderna, the stock exploded higher. The darn thing tripled over the next two months. A lot of people were left behind in that. And there were a lot of uh, Wall Street bet diamond hands that got in there, I'm sure. As the Nordstrom rally got rolling in December, the chart gave you what's known as a golden cross. This isn't just any cross. This is a golden cross. Short-term, 50-day moving average. It goes above the long-term, 200-day moving average. All right? Golden cross. Technicians love it. Then in January, Nordstrom started trading sideways. Uh, so now we figure it's done, right? Uh, no, it's digesting. Now let's make it another move. Remember, I don't like stocks that go like this. I like stocks that digest, stair step, and then go higher. Lang points out that the MACD is flashing even after this run right here, that it's going to go higher. Now, it doesn't hurt the last quarter came in better than expected. At the moment, Nordstrom's perched near its 2020 highs, but Lang's betting it could make a run at its 2018 peak. Do you know what that is? 50% higher from here. Man, that would be incredible. I may have to go to the store, see what's going on. The bottom line, sure, the non-essential high-end retailers have already run, but the charts as interpreted by our own Bob Lang suggest that Capri Holdings, Tapestry, LVMH, and Nordstrom could all have more upside here, thanks, yes, to the stimulus checks. This whole group was running out of gas a couple of weeks ago. Then Congress agreed to pump $2 trillion in, and now they're looking at another leg higher. Nordstrom. Ah. Uh, this one kills me. How could I have not seen that coming? Stay with Kramer. Just chill out. Chill man is in the house. Chill man be king. The chill man is in the house. He's happy. The lightning round is coming up when Mad Money returns. Next, children detained at the border. What they're facing inside holding facilities. Plus, a spring break nightmare for law enforcement. The facts, the truth, the news with Shepard Smith. Next, CNBC. All right, guys, thanks for joining the stream. I'm going to end it here. Apparently, that was it. That was Peter Rollinson and CCIV. This is a Patreon. I just opened the Patreon today for 50 beta members for $3.99. So <clears throat> I'm just building up the Discord. We have a few members. We have about eight members. And, um, yeah, check it out. Check out uh, my YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe, like. I cover a lot of high-growth stocks. Um, and just trying to get it going, sharing any hot news. Also, as a community, some of you guys give me some good information that I've missed. So um, together as a uh, bigger group, I'm able to see more things I normally would miss. And we're, you know, doing some legwork out here and getting through. So thank you for joining the stream. I, uh, I don't think there are going to be any more lucid news here. And I appreciate you guys for uh, stopping by. I cover most... Uh, you know, big events here uh, pertaining to SPACs and high growth stocks. So, um, yeah, make sure to sub to see the latest news. Thank you, guys.